so today's colloquium speaker, uh, David Parminter, he's done, uh, I think, a lot of work with Dragon Systems and Dragon Naturally Speaking, the creators of Dragon Naturally Speaking, and currently working for Basis. Right, right around the corner. Right, doing uh, a lot of Asian language uh, processing. So he'll correct the things I've mistaken and tell you what they actually mean. By way of uh, admissions, uh, Peter Hayashi is a good friend and neighbor of mine, and I like to think that I persuaded him to <coughs> do this program. Uh, and I've been enviously following along all the things that you've been doing. I know it's a lot of work, but um, it's it's going to be worth it. You'll you'll know way too much. You'll be overqualified when you when you get out. Um, anyway. Um, this isn't really a lecture. What I what I was thinking about when I started started this was, you know, if you guys, some fraction of you will go into industry, and uh, if you came and worked for me, this is roughly what I would hope you, what I would tell you over the course of the first year. So it's all very pragmatic, um, not very theoretical, and uh, I hope you find it instructive, even if you don't wind up going into industry. Also, um, we'll try this. We'll try making the questions as if as they come up, rather than saving them for the end, because there's a lot of discrete topics here. Um, so it might be easier to deal with it that way. Why don't we go ahead? Uh, my background is that basically I'm a self-taught uh, computer programmer. Uh, I majored in physics in college, and in fact, um, me, my peers and I really looked down on the computer profession back in college, and then. Um, I discovered that I liked to eat um, and uh, didn't like building bombs, so um, <laughs> uh, software didn't seem so bad when I graduated. Um, anyway, I've worked in the field for 17 or 18 years, uh, something like that, and pretty much been doing production systems um, of, one age, of one sort or another. I've done a few consulting projects, and I have an amazing winning streak, which is that every project I've ever worked on has shipped. I've never worked on a canceled project. Um, so <laughs> that is a little unusual, I confess, and it's bound to end any day now, but um, for now we're going to go with it. Um, anyway, haven't done any real website stuff, um, so I don't really know how applicable what I think about software is to the, um, to the web world, but um, my theory is that quite a bit of it is, and um, you'll know in April when you do the web course, um, as opposed to the systems course that you're doing now. Um, as, is, as is typical with somebody who is self-taught, there's a lot of things I don't know, and I've just been going based on what I've needed to know at any given time. Um, being open-minded and having a healthy curiosity is definitely helpful in this field, just like it is in any other. Depending on which branch you go into, you, you will be implementing systems from scratch, or large websites, or databases, or you name it. The, um, but the big thing is, it's pretty easy. It, the, 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 what's difficult about it is, is bullet one, is most real software systems are immense. No one person can comprehend them. Um, no one person can really claim to, uh, uh, to be the master of the system. And you're going to be working with a group of people who have a varied amount of skill and uh, you know, have a varied amount of interest and of different backgrounds, and you have to make that software work. That's where the trouble comes. Um, plus, you need to make it work for a long time. Next. So in my opinion, the, the history, the, you know, the, what software is all about is is basically getting that complexity under control. Um, there is that little thing about the customer, and I'll talk quite a bit about that um, going along. And the customer should guide you as to which way, you know, whenever you don't know what to do, you have to think about it from the customer's point of view. But from a technical standpoint, software is massive, it's confusing, and it's, uh, it's easy to change, and it's hard to maintain. Um, so people have adopted different strategies for dealing with it. You've seen everything from ISO 9000, ISO 9001, things like that. We, um, I have to admit, I did a survey amongst my peers, and we've never actually <laughs> met anybody who did that. That's really hardcore. It's more of a manufacturing kind of a thing. But you'll see um, software processes along, you know, things like waterfall models, things that they are advocated for the Software Engineering Institute, um, classic products requirements, and um, all the way down to code like help. And um, the, it, it, it's pretty appalling how much code like hell there is out there. Um, and the, um, 
I was reading in the Globe just a couple of weeks ago about some guy who had a, some financial startup and he said, well, yeah, we put a cappuccino machine in, free cappuccino, because we're here all the time, slaving away. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's one place I don't want to work. Um, the, um, don't, don't go and work for a place where they're slaving away, working all the time, staying up all night writing code, because you have to stay up the next night undoing what you did the night before. Um, <laughs> and I really mean that. Anyway, there, I'm not going to tell you that one process is, is going to work better than another. If you don't start a company, you're going to go to a company. Um, and they're going to have some kind of a process in place, and it will it will be somewhere in this spectrum from no process to uh, to something that is highly structured. And just about everything above above no process at all um, has merits, and there's 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 good and there's bad about it. And you just need to learn to work with it. Uh, go ahead. Anyway, uh, lately. Um, what I discussed is fairly traditional, stuff you've seen in the 80s. Lately, um, the rise of the open source movement has, has really kind of changed things, and software is different. Um, so you're seeing now where you've got one guy like Linus Torvalds, or you've got one guy like uh, Larry Wall, or one guy like Guido Van Rossum, and he sort of is, he or she is the fountain of, of what goes on. And either, you know, effectively, it's all, it's all reviewed by them or it's sort of checked out by them. And um, it's amazing what you can do if you, if you go that way. And if, I don't know if any of you have ever contributed to an open source project, but they're awesome. They, they, the, the quality is just tends to be off the charts compared to industrial software. Um, and... It's it's um, it's definitely interesting, and I recommend it. The other the other sort of new wave thing that's come up in the last few years is the extreme programming movement, um, and um, this this looks really exciting uh, to my mind. At basis, we've adopted portions of the extreme programming paradigm. Um, uh, are any of you familiar with this yet? Okay, well I'll talk about it for a couple of minutes then. The um, the the idea behind the extreme programming is basically they test their software first. They, they literally they write a unit test that demonstrates what they want the software to do. And of course, the software can't do that. So then they make the software do that. They check the whole thing in, and then they repeat. Um, and um, it's really hardcore in the sense that they basically test the software all the time. They review it all the time, peer review. Um, and um, they roll it out to their customers every, you know, every four to six weeks, which is very, very rapid by normal standards. You know, shrink wrap software, which is what I've done in the past, you do it once a year. Now, um, you, a lot can go wrong <laughs> in a year, whereas if you do it in six weeks, you, you'll know where, where you stand really quickly. Um, I will talk more about extreme programming offline if people are, are interested in it, but... Um, the basic idea is that all that stuff I showed you at the beginning with, you know, functional specs and so on and so forth, they kind of turn it around and they, they, it's more about use cases. They say, I want to be able to do the following thing as payroll system. It says we need to be paid biweekly. So if the system pays you biweekly and you have a test that demonstrates that you're being paid biweekly, you're done. And if there's something you want the system to do that, it, that, uh, that isn't captured in the test, you write a test and say, I want it to do this. And then when, it, when the test passes, you're done. Go ahead. Uh, then just, uh, just for completeness, there is the, you know, there's the, we don't have a process, but we talk a lot. And you'll see a lot of this in dot coms. Um, and um, that's part of why people... You know, my own theory about dot coms, you can see I'm a little disdainful, but my own theory is it's not so much that people work all the time, it's that they're at work all the time. Um, and um, it's, um, it's it, this isn't really quite right. They, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with, with communicating effectively. One of my peers, uh, when I was managing, said that he basically felt like the thing he did every day, all day, was to get the developers to talk. And that there's just there is no substitute for that level of oh you're doing this oh that's interesting how did you do that you know um, and the no process document can capture that so so there's something important there but that can't be the only thing that you're doing it won't work um, go ahead um, 
All right, so the, the remainder of my talk is going to be kind of divided up. We talked about strategies. Now I'm going to talk about habits, things that I think you need to do um, and things that you, and these are my habits, for, or these are my good habits, let's put it that way. Um, and um, then we'll also talk about tools, um, things that, you know, the, the things you need to do your job, assuming you are in the software field. So um, really, I can't say this enough times. You've got to talk to the customer. Even if you're a lowly engineer implementing some CGI script in the website, uh, it doesn't matter. Um, you, if anything that's going, anything that you're doing that's new in your enterprise, if you can, you should fly it by somebody and just see, does this make sense? Would you value this? Um, does it, uh, and if you do this, if you get in the habit of doing this, you will, you will shoot to the top of your profession because you have a huge advantage over people who think they're so technically brilliant that what, whatever they do is something that people want. It isn't true. Um, so, um, and it's, you know, it doesn't really seem that hard. The, the trick is, you know, if it's like shrink wrap software, you may not be able to find a customer per se. So what you need to do is you need to find somebody who resembles the customer. So um, you have to, you know, or a highly vertical app that let's say that it's, you know, it's only going to be bought by, you know, PhD molecular biologists and they're going to pay $100,000 for it. Um, you, you have to go and find these people because otherwise you don't really know what they want. They're not going to like it as much um, as, they, as they would normally. And again, it doesn't matter. You don't have to be in management. You don't have to be in marketing or sales to, to be customer focused. And a lot of management types, for whatever reason, are a little allergic to the customer. And you, you, can, you, know, you can really challenge your organization's assumptions in a positive way um, by saying, well, I talked to this person and, you know, don't say your mother. That's the one thing. Um, nobody will believe you if you say, well, I talked to my mom or my uncle or my auntie. Um, so as long as it's not at that level, um, everything's fine. And if you ever catch one of the business people saying this, then they should be shot. Um, Anyway, some of these things, since a lot of you are prof have already been professionals, these are pretty basic, but um, asking questions, not being shy about, don't, don't worry about making a fool of yourself. What you don't know is not going to hurt you. There's all kinds of things like that. And if you can, when you join an organization, if there's somebody who's been around who likes to tell you stuff, um, just soak it up. There's just, you know, there's a lot of people who are quite happy to talk. I, I'm a notorious blabbermouth, so if you came to me, I'd tell you what I think. Don't worry. And, you know, you might learn something. Uh, again, same kind of deal as in terms of networking. Don't, you know, don't, don't, also don't just do it within your company. Talk to your friends. You guys are all going to go off and do stuff and you should stay in touch. You, you have the soundings of a very good network here um, for going forward. You know that people don't change jobs fairly frequently and, you know, I won't, I won't go near the issue of being loyal to your employer. I'm very loyal, I promise. Uh, the, um, but um, your, the network that you have is part of your skill and it's part of your it's part of your tool set um, going forward um, don't work for bozos I really mean this if you go and interview for a place and they don't know what the hell they're doing don't think you're gonna save them just say thanks a lot and then it's also the same thing don't work with bozos when you go to when <laughs> when you go to interview you're interviewing them it's, it's not just that they're interviewing you and thinking about offering you a job you know, you need to value yourself highly and say, this is my, you know, this is my career we're talking about. You, you know, you get one, you have one option to play, which is what you do. Um, okay, anyway, a little bit more practical. Um, there's going to be downtime in your job. There's going to be times when the management doesn't know what the hell it's doing. There's going to be times when your project is canceled. Or there's going to be times where you're waiting for it to build. Don't play solitaire. Don't play quake. Don't play foosball. Open Emacs. And go and look in the project source code. Look at something you've never seen before and figure out how it works. See if you can figure out, see if you can find a flaw in it or learn something from it. Um, you could, if you stayed at a place long enough, you could really master the whole system if, if, just in your downtime. Uh, you could certainly get a lot of breadth and a lot of depth. Um, another cheap thing about the open source movement, you guys heard from Stallman, so I don't need to tell you one word about that. Um, <laughs> Um, but there's really good stuff there, and you get to see the source. You get to see how people do stuff, and you can read the source. So what are you waiting for? Um, you're working on a complex system, and this is really true. Even for a website, um, 
it's just devilishly difficult to debug it unless you build the debugging right into the system. I don't know what your systems course is going to be like and how complicated the things you're going to be working are. But a lot of times, you know, you, you produce a system that, that basically operates in what I call a probabilistic stew. And um, <clears throat> it's going to be difficult to, to figure, if it doesn't work, it's going to be difficult to figure out why. And you need, to, you, you need to be in the habit of instrumenting your code. I mean, just as a really easy example, Apache has a log, has two logs, an access log and an error log. And when I'm debugging my own little website at home, I, the logs are invaluable. I don't have to run Apache through the debugger to figure out what happened, A. B, it's never Apache's fault. It's, it's always my fault. Um, um, but, you know, there's, there's issues about the inputs and the outputs. So you, you need to have a system whereby uh, you can do this. When I did the speech recognition product for Dragon Systems, it was immensely complex. It had 10 or 15 threads running, multiple processes, and we put all kinds of debugging stuff in there. We, it, it could all be turned off um, when you don't need it, but um, spending the time to instrument your system and have it be debuggable, is that is what software engineering is about um, going along. Um, Okay, uh, can you click on that right-hand link? I just want to show you something. Uh, this is a trick I learned pretty recently, but Google, it's all out there. It, it, pretty much anything you want to do, somebody's written about it. So just to give you an example, this is hard to read, but I was debugging this problem where I, was, I got what's known as a UMR, uninitialized memory read, from my program. And I'm going, jeez, that is, I can't explain it. I don't know why it's happening. So I literally, I went to Google, I typed in underscore door underscore return. This is the name of a function in the C runtime library in Solaris, all right? The, the only hit that came back was a project note from Project Mozilla, open source. Click on that link where it says um, purifying Mozilla on Solaris. Um, and it basically talks about how, about this, this link talks about the fact that this is a UMR, you don't need to worry about it. It's a benign UMR coming from the operating system and you can just skip it. 10 seconds, I'm done. Uh, go ahead and hit back. Um, there's a lot of content out there on Google. Uh, pretty much anything you want to do, usually somebody's done it. There's a lot of you know, university projects where their builds, just the, you know, the dumps from their builds are, are on their extranet for some reason or other. So you'll see, you're, trying to, you're trying to comprehend a compiler warning. Type the compiler warning into the system and you'll find, you'll find other examples of people who got it. Um, Okay, moving along. Um, as much as possible when you're working, these, these are, this, this is a habit you can do for yourself when you go off and you join your job. Keep it small, keep it simple. Don't, don't not, you know, if you, if you can't check in for six or eight weeks at a time, it's just gonna be a disaster when you do check in. You, you wanna check in a hell of a lot faster than that. Uh, the XP movement, they check in every two hours. Um, literally, they do a little thing, they check it in, and then they rerun their tests, and then they do it again, and they do it again. And um, the um, working in discrete chunks, it's hard for me to relate that to the, I don't really know the size of the assignments that you're doing here, but just imagine that one of your, your worst, most nightmarish assignment, imagine you all had to work on it together for a year. Um, <laughs> and then, you'll, then you sort of start to imagine what it's like to work on a big software project. Um, All right. Oh, another key point, and I expect this is not really a problem based on the way that you're doing this, but being in the habit of writing programs from uh, scratch, starting with int, main, open parenthesis, close parenthesis, squiggle, squiggle, <laughs> um, and just going with it. There are a lot of engineers who never do this. They cannot write a program from scratch. Don't be like that. Um, you really will learn a lot as a result of actually writing a program from the word go. Um, and you know, if I sat down and wrote down the number of programs I'd written it, from scratch, it isn't that many, maybe 20, 30, something like that, where you started with a blank project. I mean, some of them went on for years, so it's, um, it's not as, you know, it's not as bad as it sounds. But that, th this is one of the main ways you learn because there's just no substitute. If you take a class library and you put a couple of things together and you say, oh, I'm off and running, you'll never really know what your system can do and it, ha it has a whole bunch of baggage. Um, that, um, that you didn't ask for. Go ahead. All right, um, again, 
this is from this is the management perspective. If your manager asks you to do something, just finish it. Write the doc, put the whole thing together, comment the code, don't put it off because you won't remember what you were doing. There will be details about it. Um, it it's uh, it's pretty basic. I won't spend a long time on that. Um, reading the manual. I'll skip the F part. Uh, the um, it's amazing how few, how frequently people sort of think they can get by without reading the manual. And this is a trap that everybody falls into. But take the time, read the manual. It's not just that it will help you solve the problem that you have right now. Um, it's that you'll learn a lot about the tools. You're working with these tools. You're going to spend every day of your life using Emacs, using the make system, using the compiler. Um, I hope that doesn't sound too bleak. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, and... Um, you know, getting to know the things. They, they have a lot of nice tricks. There's things they can do that will really increase your productivity. Okay, another one. This just happened to me today. I wrote this nightly build system where I work. We, it takes, all the tech, takes everything out of version control, runs it all, compiles it clean from scratch, runs all the tests, and what do you know? Every night something's wrong. So um, the correct response, if somebody finds a defect in your software, is not, you're a bad person. Why are you doing this to me? I'm so unhappy. Please. <laughs> It's, thank you. you. You want to find the defects in your system, and it's not, it, nobody's a bad person. This, all software is defective. It's just, a lot of times you just haven't found the defects yet. Um, it's too complex not to be defective. Okay, next bullet is a little, I had trouble explaining this to my peers. I tried this talk out on several of them. Um, when I say don't program by experimentation, I guess I mean don't, don't, if you're looking at a body of code and you can't figure out why it doesn't work, and you say, well, let's try this. That isn't quite right. Uh, if you try it and it does something, that's data that you can use to analyze whether you've solved the problem. But computer systems, they really are rational. Um, they, it's, not, um, it's not like dealing with the real world or with some mechanical system where the, you know, the, you know, the metal is fatigued or it's too cold or it's too hot. Um, they, they really actually do what they're supposed to, they do what they've been instructed to do every step of the way. Next. Okay, um, another thing on a daily basis, you're getting, you're, you're, you come to work and you have to check out a file and then you want to see if anybody has diffed the file. It, does, it hardly matters. Whatever you do, um, if you find yourself doing it and you're generating a lot of keystrokes, it's time to automate. Um, the, the being in the habit of automating your, your workflow is a way to increase your productivity by huge, huge factors. Um, Remember, you're in this, you know, here it's all variety. But when you, when, when you, get off, when you go off to work, you're going to kind of do the same things over and over again. You're going to run make. You're going to run a compiler. You're going to just, you know, you're going to keep going. Um, and um, anything that's slowing you down, just automate it. So um, that means if you can, you know, write a cron job so, the thing, so it does a clean build every night at midnight or 2 or whenever, you, whenever it is that nobody's using the system. Come in in the morning and say, whoa. It built clean. It didn't build clean. You know. Because anything that has to be done with the poke of a finger, it means somebody has to remember to poke the finger. If you can just make it go, and furthermore, if you can make the finger pokes as powerful as possible, it'll, it'll, it'll really help you a lot. Um, my own personal choice is Python. That's the language I use. I understand you use Ruby here. That's probably fairly similar. Um, I've never used Ruby, but... Um, uh, I'm a, I and most of my peers are huge Python fans. It, it really can do almost anything. Um, and it's, it's really quite suitable for, the, for automation tasks. Um, it tends to, tends to interact with almost all other computer programs very well. Um, I don't know if you guys did regular expressions here, but this is a basic part of the programmer's toolbox, is using regular expressions for grepping through source code, finding things, substitute, replace, just doing basic analytical stuff. Um, it's hugely powerful. Um, furthermore, Emacs has a wonderful regular expression engine built into it, so you can do, you can, you, you, Emacs has pretty much everything built into it. So um, you, can, you can really gain a lot of knowledge about a large body of code by, by use of regular expressions, um, and you can really get, a, get control of it. I mean, a perfect example, um, my company, we're legally bound to mark the you know, copyright dates on our software as we go. So we, uh, it doesn't really provide you much pr protection, but you, you, know, you do need to do it anyway. Nobody in their right mind is going to check out 800 files and change the zero to one. Um, you have to automate a task like that. You're crazy if you don't. Um, 
Okay, so wherever possible, you want to automate the you want to automate the testing of your system. This is the if you if you automate it all, you want to automate the testing of your system. Um, I just as an exercise this afternoon while I was reviewing my slides, I'll give you a, an example: dead links. So Python has a module that's built that, it's a sample program. It's not part of their standard thing. It's called Web Checker. Um, and what it does is you point it at a URL, <coughs> it follows all the links in the URL and tells you which ones are dead. So it takes me one minute to download Python, install it on my system, another minute to look at the program, learn it. So I pointed it at hp.com, compact.com, ibm.com, my own supplier, and Oracle, and uh, as a control, oh, I did some, uh, and Art Technology Group, which is a company down the street. HP, Compact, IBM, Basis, and Oracle all had dead links that I found within 30 seconds. Now, these people are claiming to be, you know, the best, the most professional web development environments and the people that you could ever talk to. How could they have a dead link? Um, it shouldn't happen. So, it, it, you know, they should have automated systems that check that their websites actually work. Uh, I find it mind-boggling. Anyway... Um, there's other things that you can do, just, you know, server uptime, server downtime, server responsiveness. Um, one of the things we do is there are certain coding practices that we don't approve of in my company, like naming customers by name, um, no swear words. There was something I was reading through Philip Greenspun's talk at the beginning of the season. <laughs> I found that quite interesting. Um, we check for that, and we, won't, we, won't, we basically don't, you know, we block check-ins that, that have uh, inappropriate language because we license our source code to customers. Um, so um, there's all kinds of automation tasks. That's just the tip of the iceberg. Go ahead. Uh, refactoring is a is a sort of a fancy pants word for taking your code apart and putting it back together. I mean, the classic example is you have object A and it has certain capabilities, and then you discover that you actually mean objects A prime and A double prime, and you need to rework the system because A prime and A double prime don't have the same properties, so you have to refactor. It's it's endemic. It's it's inherent in in an ob in, in an object oriented environment, but People, the whole process is scary to people because they don't really know if their program works. They don't know how it works. They don't know what, you know, they don't know what they're about to break. Um, and that's why your system basically has to have as near to full coverage on automated testing as it possibly can. Even a website. You can do a lot on a website if you put your mind to it to test it. Um, and if you have automated testing, you can change it. If the tests all pass, you can't prove it doesn't work anymore. Um, and that's that's really what it's all about. The um, what I like to say is that you know there was has, was a metaphor in the 80s of software architecture and people claiming to be the architect of the system and so on and so forth. And I think that sounds good to business types, but I prefer gardener. Um, the software is really much more like a garden. It's something that is going to it gets weeds, it springs up, it needs care and feeding at all times. It's you, you know every time you change it, something could be breaking. Um, or something could be not quite right, or something, you know, you, you need to be prepared to change the software on an ongoing basis. It's just part of it. I don't really agree with the if it's not um, broken, don't fix it philosophy. I think, you know, it, it doesn't quite capture, capture things. Uh, there's a lot of resources go ahead on uh, refactoring. I'll be, I, I have a link of resources at the end. I'll be happy to point some to you. All right. Um, then there's the, so those were, those were habits. There's the basic tools. There's the stuff that you use and the way that you use these tools, um, some of which are, you have to, you, nobody's going to, you can't function without a compiler. And some of these things are things that are optional, but you really want them. The, um, the, there's enormous productivity gains that can be obtained this way. So, you know, this is a little preachy and I apologize, but um, if, if, if at all possible, you know, take time to learn the tool. It's, you know, you can't be a carpenter without going to carpentry school, but you, you know, there's no license for being a software engineer. Um, so uh, you really, you know, you, you'll do yourself and your employer a big favor if you, if you do this. Um, let's go ahead. All right. Uh, version control is, I, I'd like to think it's pretty basic, but I've seen a lot of, a lot of companies that don't even have this. Um, this means you check the file out. Have you guys talked about version control at all? Okay. Um, in my opinion, you, I, you have to have this even for a one-person, three-day project. You will make a mistake. You'll want to get back to where you were before. Um, 
you'll delete the file. <laughs> We've all done it. Um, it, it's, it happens all the time. Or a virus will come and eat your, eat your system. Um, there's not a lot more I can say about version control. I've talked about automated testing. That you, um, as much as possible, you have to force yourself to write the tests. Um, there, this is, there's a lot of resistance to this in the software community, but the fact that it's automated, it means that, you know, the day after you quit, you know, your, your intentions are still captured in the tests. Um, and you will quit. Most, I mean, the odds of you working for one place for the rest of your life are nil. Um, <laughs> so, uh, nightly build system is the same deal. Um, whatever it is, it needs to be integrated and, and checked and tested as often as possible. It might, you know, something like Windows NT, it takes like five days to compile. They can't do a nightly build. Um, so, but whatever the, whatever the unit of time is that you can, that you can do, you should do it. If it's a really short project, you could consider doing it every hour. Um, just, you know, it's running off in the background. The computer's not going to get tired. Um, all right, a uh, bug database, it's again, you know, you'll find companies that think they can get away without it. Um, it's kind of, it's kind of, a, it's a kind of a funny thing is because, like when I worked at Dragon Systems, it was shrink wrap software uh, with tremendous schedule pressures. So we constantly had to basically screw the customer over and say, that doesn't matter, we're not going to fix it. Or that's what the business people told us. And if you read about shrink wrap software, you'll see this happens all the time. Well, we had an extremely sophisticated bug system that allowed us to do triage and examine bugs from all different lights. And there were like 5,000 bugs in that system when I left Dragon Systems. Um, that's totally out of control. Um, in a sense, the bug system was too good. It was enabling our bad behavior. Um, that having been said, you, you really um, you need to have some programmatic way of keeping track of what you're doing. Uh, Ars Digita uses a ticket system. I've looked at that. It looks fine. And what's nice about that idea is there, it's not just defects, any defects, any customer encounter, any, you know, even like we need to buy more Coke for the Coke machine, that all goes into that system. And basically the idea is nobody, you know, then you don't forget. Email is not going to cut it. Email is not an effective communications tool in terms of uh, completeness. It's, it's okay for immediacy, but you, you, you just can't rely on it um, beyond that. Um, Okay, another thing, quality, con quality coverage and performance analyzers. Um, you're, you know, uh, let's see, how do I describe this? There are third-party software tools out there. The ones that we use at my company are from Rational Systems. Um, there are others that, that uh, work, like Numega has a cheaper one. Rational stuff is very expensive, but it's worth every penny. I mean, it, you know, the cost of a Rational license is way less than the monthly salary of a good engineer. Again, when I was at Dragon, we used, um, we, it was a Windows program, we used MFC, Microsoft's Foundation class. It's not a bad class library, but um, the uh, coverage, the quality analyzer that we used found so many problems that it just masked our own problems. Um, so, <laughs> There's kind of two lessons here. We shouldn't have used that class library. It was not high quality, and that, in fact, was true. Um, and because of that, then we couldn't use the, use the quality analyzer. Yes? Did you define coverage? Oh, sure. Coverage analyzer. All right. I'll, I'll run through each of them. 